All right, welcome to uh, this week's uh, Personal Finance 131 course. What happened was uh, that, you know, obviously we didn't have the course on Friday or on, um, on Tuesday in the uh, regular lecture time because of the holiday, you know, on the preceding Monday. And then on Thursday, uh, we did it in the classroom, but the internet connectivity just wasn't good and there's some screen problems and some other things that when I went back and looked at the video I was about to uh, publish, it just wasn't, wasn't you know, good product. So anyway, what I'm going to do today, and I'll put this out here in a few minutes, is uh, just go through some of the, uh, the tax implications that we were talking about, some of the tax planning strategies. And it's kind of important that, you know, we have a good internet connection to do this. So that's why I wanted to, to delay a little bit. Um, first thing we want to talk about, though, is the, the concept of tax brackets that I alluded to last week. Again, it's kind of often misunderstood by folks what actual tax brackets are. And I kind of, you know, talked about it last week, but I didn't have exact numbers for you because obviously they're the numbers, you know, as you look at them right here, this is for 2015 or, yeah, 2015, um, you know, they, they seem a bit arbitrary because they, they change every year and there's a lot um, that, that goes into it. So um, the way it works is, for example, if you're, you know, a single filer, we'll just stick with an easy example. What would happen is um, for your first chunk of income, this first slug of income, you know, up to 9,000, um, you know, only 10% of that is going to be taxed. And in reality, you're you're not even going to be paying that. You're going to get money back if you're, um, you know, have whatever type of situation. If you have, you know, kids or something else, that, that's not really a, a living wage. People will will generally, uh, um, you know, have some sort of assistance or something if they're, you know, an adult, a single filer like that. Um, this next slug from, you know, a little over nine thousand up to thirty seven thousand that incremental amount is going to be taxed at at fifteen percent so it doesn't mean when people say oh no I don't want to jump into that next tax bracket that's kind of a silly argument because let's say and this is you know a strange example but let's say you happen to make thirty seven thousand four hundred and you know fifty one dollars well, that doesn't mean that you jump into a 25% tax bracket. It just means that that last $1 that puts you in this bracket, that last $1, 25% of it's going to be taxed. But that chunk from you know a little over 9000 to 37000 is still going to be um, only at the 15%. And that um, first you know amount of money you had is, is only going to be at 10%. So, um, and... And if, you know, as we work up in the, the system, and often we'll, we'll talk about 28% tax bracket because that's where a lot of people sort of find themselves once you get out and get a job. And, you know, if you're trying to do a quick calculation in terms of, of uh, you know, charitable giving or something, you'll probably figure either a 25 or a 28% tax bracket to, to figure out, you know, as a rough wag. But anyway, um, if you ask somebody who's making, say, you know, a hundred thousand. Um, what their average tax is, which is different than a, a tax. What's the average tax over their whole hundred thousand income? You can see that it's going to be nowhere near twenty-eight percent. It's going to be down, you know, probably around twenty percent. It's going to be all of these amounts averaged together. There's a real quick video that I put out there that maybe those numbers will explain it to you a, a little differently and maybe make it a little bit clearer for you. Um, <clears throat> next thing, you know, now here we've got the different categories. And again, you, you know, if you're single, you're single, you know, you can't really change that. Although if you have children, you qualify for certain things, you may be able to qualify for head of household. Um, but again, um, your children can also age out of that once they're, you know, filing on their own, once they're, um, through college, you, you no longer can do that. But in here, in the married, um, you, you do have options. And you can, you know, look at your specific tax situation 
and this is the beauty of, of some of these, you know, online tax programs or computer tax programs where you can just quickly, um, you know, check the married block or check the married filing separately block and, and you know, decide what's the most advantageous for you. So you can see that, you know, the numbers, although um, in, the, in the jointly we're talking two incomes here, so... Um, you know, but if you've got a, say, a stay-at-home spouse, um, you know, you would probably want to be filing jointly. But anyway, you, you know, you'll look at each situation, you'll run the numbers each way. And the way this works, too, um, <clears throat> if you, you know, get married on December 29th or something, you're, you're married for the year. Or if you get divorced on, you know, January 2nd, uh, you were married for, for that year as well. So it, it has to do with, with the entire period. Um, another thing we touched on last week, if we can get this slide to go, was capital gains tax. Now, again, I'm talking the short-term and long-term capital gains. Short-term capital gains, I'm not going to spend much time on it. Just the, the rate's going to be a little bit higher. But the difference would be... Um, in a long-term capital gains, it's something you've held for more than a year. So if we're talking, you know, investments, retirements and stuff, um, you know, this class, we're really not going to address, you know, day trading and, and aggressive moves in the stock market. We're, so we're looking more at long-term capital gains. <clears throat> and for long-term capital gains, you can see that the rates are, are lower. So why is that? And, and you know, truth is that uh, very wealthy, you know, they tend to make more money off their investments than they do off of income, you know, earned income. They're not necessarily working an hourly wage or even a, um, you know, they, they usually have some sort of stock incentive program or something where it's not all in wages. So, um, yeah, th there are some inequities in the in the tax system. But, but for you as an investor, for example, um, you know, this this is rather attractive that these rates are are a bit lower. But the other thing is too that you know we're talking here about income tax, and and um, if if you know you are careful and you save some money and you put in an account, and then you invest it, you know, and and you start to earn um, interest on it, it's you know it can be argued that it's not very fair to again tax you at a high rate you know you've already paid taxes on this once you know before you put it in the bank and and then when you start to make money on it if they were to take as big a chunk um, you know that wouldn't necessarily be fair but more importantly um, it might also discourage you from saving discourage you from investing if you're just going to pay it all back in taxes so you, you'll see the capital gains rate will will change and that's that's probably more political than than the regular income tax, at least in our nation, you know, like I've said, in, in certain certain you know countries, they've they've gone up with these huge millionaire tax rates where they're ninety percent. It's it's kind of a populist measure that really, um, at the end of the day, they tend not to get that money. And it, it um, you know, to go back to an earlier slide, um, y you can you know kind of love them or hate them, but. There's a, a man named Art Laffer, if you're really into this stuff, but he talks about at a certain point, um, you know, the, the amount of tax you're going to be able to derive is going to diminish if, if you keep increasing the taxes at a certain rate. Where that rate lies, yeah, people will argue about that, but the, the concept is pretty sound that, a you know, a, a bigger pie um, works out and, you know, we even, both sides of the politicians have realized this you know Kennedy was a, a big fan of you know a rising tide raises all boats and um, anyway some of those things are controversial now but they, they didn't necessarily used to be um, so what I want to do too that that's a little bit about the tax brackets again you can look at that um, example and and you know on the video if it makes more sense to you um, Hopefully that'll work for you. Um, <clears throat> what I'm doing now is 
I'm going to go on to uh, TurboTax. Again, you can do whatever you like. This is, I've got a real TurboTax account that I use, you know, for my own taxes. And then I've got a bogus one that I've set up using the university address. And I just fill in, you know, a few numbers just to make it, um, you know, so that the, the program will run. Um, so the, And so anyway, I'm not saying you have to be a customer in any of these tax programs. You don't actually pay for it until you until you file so you know have at it in terms of going in there and sort of exploring things and seeing what the the tax implications of different processes are okay so um, you know they they call me UAA because that's what I put in as my name um, let me show you some of the personal info I put in here so again you know one two three four five just a bogus social put in some random name born in 85 maybe um, yeah, married Alaska. I, but I can change any of these numbers. So that's the big deal. I put in a kid, my kid, whatever. Same sort of social almost. Born in 2003, lived somewhere here in Alaska. Anyway, so, you know, it's, it's useful. You got to put in a little bit of information because it knows, it needs to know I'm Alaska resident since we don't have state income tax at this point and some other things like that. Um, it wants to jump into business income. I'm not going to do business right now, but you could you could do that depending on you know the program you you have set. Um, we'll just walk through everything. Um, at the end of the year, you're always going to get a whole bunch of tax documents in the mail. You're already getting them now. You know you're going to get at a minimum if you've got a job, you're going to get W-2s. You'll get things called 1099s for investments. You'll get 1098s for school. You'll get you get all these different documents, and you know normally they won't show up till the end of of January. So again, if we're going to be doing taxes. Um, it, it's it's helpful again to kind of have estimated amounts and you can probably go with last year's totals if there's some consistency for, for planning sake but anyway um, you know here's the w2 number I entered in um, my own numbers here just sort of um, you know made up some numbers now uh, what we were talking about last week I mentioned you know if you're getting a huge refund it's because there's you know more money being withheld than is necessary and you do have some um, ability to basically manipulate this number the federal tax withheld based upon the number of your dependents now your employer you know once you sign that form they're gonna start doing the withholding or if you're a private you know if you've got a private business you may have to do your own withholdings but anyway 6500 on a hundred thousand dollars income is probably a little bit low you know that's only 6.5 percent so I'll tell you what let's boost that up let's put that at um, for sake of argument you can't do this on a, on an actual um, w-2 you know it is what it is it's box whatever and you you have to type in that number or maybe have it actually you know auto populated if you import it but anyway uh, there's other things in here, tips, you know, if you're doing that kind of stuff, Social Security. I'm not going to put in all those numbers because it's not necessary for the examples we're, we're running. Um, what's going to happen is since I withheld $10,000, now it's telling me I'm going to owe, or right now I'm actually getting money back. So it's saying I've, I've overpaid based upon some of the other numbers that I've already entered in. Um, it, it does go sequential, but since I've been jumping around in this particular example, um, you know, some of these numbers have changed. So, again, a lot of these obscure kind of things in the tax code, you know, um, you know, different anomalies, you know, I'm an inmate, am I whatever. Hopefully all these things are none of the above. Um, anyway, and then it just kind of gives me a summary. So, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time in this, but... What I want to show you is some of the categories. So, um, you know, the wages and salary, that's going to be taxed at a certain rate. Income, dividends, some of these other things. And now we're starting to get into capital gains. So this is where it gets more confusing. Um, investment income. So it's going to know uh, what the different rates are. But anyway, um, on the income side, you know, there's not a whole lot of, 
changes you can you can make. You can delay uh, things from one year to the other, maybe to to make it more favorable. But uh, once the you know end of the year hits again, everything is frozen, and most of these things are all coming to you on forms. You know, 1099Gs if you want a bunch of money in gambling. Um, you know, um, other foreign income type things, business income. So, but all these things are, are, you know, accounted for. Um, so, anyway, it's sale of a home. Um, this can change greatly. We'll look at this. this. This is where they aren't necessarily, I mean, you can go in here and find out the rules, but as we know, the... Uh, the sale of a home is a is a good deal in terms of capital gains if you've lived in it two out of the past five years you'd be able to get a, a two hundred fifty thousand um, dollar allowance that's that's not taxable five hundred thousand if if you're married so anyway all those things would you know you, you would you would run through it and uh, and come up with an income now when you do taxes um, you have different options. And probably a lot of you have just taken either a standard deduction or just done some t simple, you know, tax form of 1040 easy. And you are going to get to the point, hopefully pretty soon, where you're going to itemize your deductions. And itemizing allows you to take full advantage of everything that you, you know, sort of do in life in terms of your expenses to get hopefully a, a bigger refund or at least pay um, less in the way of taxes. So. Um, this itemization, though, goes, you know, quite a bit easier if if you've got a, a program uh, to do it. So anyway, we're going to go through and we're just going to jump around. I just want to kind of show you graphically some, some uh, um, you know, examples of, of what we've done to affect this tax owed number. In this case, it's a refund. Um, one of the things I've done, you can see that there's 18,000 bucks in there under the mortgage interest section. So that is incentive for, for me, you know, you, whatever, to, to buy a home. Um, when, when you're buying a home, and we'll talk more about this when, when we're looking at housing, but if you take out a huge loan, you know, let's say a $300,000 loan, maybe not that huge, but, but anyway, a big loan for a home. Um, and your payment, let's say, is about two thousand a month. That's about twenty four thousand. Well, it is twenty four thousand dollars a year that you're paying on that house and payments. Well, when that loan is is you know in the earlier, it's, say it's a thirty year mortgage, uh, those first years you're paying a whole whole lot of interest. And so it would not be unusual to say that $18,000 out of that $24,000 is actually interest. You don't do this calculation. It comes to you, and again, in a mortgage uh, certificate. I believe it's a 1098. But anyway, do you get a, a detail? Let's look at this real quick. So um, edit it, and we'll go in here, Wells Fargo. You, The way mortgages work is... Uh, you can go to a residential or home state or whatever mortgage company you want, but those folks tend not to hold the mortgage. They tend to take care of all the details. They, they provide a valuable service. But, yeah, about a month after, after you get the home, that loan has been sold to probably Wells Fargo in all cases, but most cases. Anyway, um, points were not going there. But see, here, here's where they're talking about this 1098. And that's a form that's going to tell you exactly how much interest you paid. So you don't have to do that calculation. Um, it, it, it comes to you. In this case, I'm saying it was you know 18,000 bucks. So by doing that, um, you know the taxes are, are you know we're going to get about 1,500 dollars back. Guess what? Let's just zero that out and say we're a renter now. What happens? Whoops. So, 1500 bucks um, basically is a, is a penalty for, for being a renter. So, that's not, you know, it's, it's just a, there's a lot of moving parts there to figure out exactly what that amount is. But if you type in your numbers and you, you know, you, you type in as if you had a home 
or if you didn't have a home, um, that's going to make a huge change. So I'm going to go ahead and I've been fortunate enough to pretty much always own a home, so I'm going to I'm going to type that back in there to make that more realistic. So and there's our refund back. Um, some other things you can do, you know, home energy credits. Again, what qualifies, you know, um, you know, there's going to be examples in here. But again, you can't be running out to buy, you know, more efficient windows or, or solar panels or before you do any of that, you know, and with the understanding that you're going to write it off in your taxes the next year, do a little bit of research and, and find out. Now, am I going to, you know, go to the IRS and say, well, TurboTax told me to do it. Now, I'm going to go in here and, and, you know, look at some of this information and then, you know, confirm it with an IRS pub to, to make sure. You know, th these programs are fairly decent. In fact, they have an optional service where you can pay to, uh, you know, get some audit protection from them. But, again, um, you're the one who's going to actually sign the return in the end, so you're responsible what's on it. Um, so you're going to see all these other items on here that, you know, are, are basically, you know, people chasing government cheese, you know, DC home buyer. Each one of these is a, you know, pet project of, of somebody. Some of them are valuable, though, you know, adoption credit, uh, child tax credit, you know, those are, those are positive attributes. Charitable deductions. You can see in here, um, you know, it says I donated $700 to, to charity. Let's look at, uh, you know, let's say I'm, I'm a bit more magnanimous, and let's edit that. Yeah, so it's in the correct tax year. Again, taxes are always done historically. So when you file taxes in 2016, you're you're looking at 2014 data. So let's see. Let's get this. What tax year are we using here? Anyway, we'll continue with that. Um, <clears throat> again, if you're going to give stuff to charity, you know, categorize it, maybe take pictures of it. Ideally, when you take it to whoever you're giving it to, don't usually just drop it on the curb. If you can go in there and, and you know, ask for a receipt, it, it may make things a lot less painful than an audit if you're claiming a lot of stuff. But let's say, you know, I'm basically moving, clearing out the house, going to take those guys. 1500 bucks worth of stuff, right? <clears throat> Again, the, you know, they're going to ask, where did you come up with this number? Did you have it appraised? Did you find that price in the catalog? Again, uh, thrift shop value maybe. However you're doing this, you're, you know, trying to keep things square so you, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I had 700 in there. I increased it up to 1500 but you can see my taxes, boom. So I got a bit of a of a, of a uh, scooby there on the, the taxes. Now, how did that work? Again, that goes back to that marginal tax rate. So the marginal tax rate, let's say, for, for sake of argument in this case, we're in a 25% marginal tax rate. Um, what, what happened was actually we were... I, Put my income here at a hundred thousand, so I'm going to use a 28% marginal tax rate just to make it a little clearer. Anyway, so if I um, give, in this case, let's say one thousand dollars worth of, of stuff to um, the charity, what's going to happen is my income um, is going to be reduced by by one thousand. And how much does that save me in terms of taxes? Since I'm in a 28% tax bracket, it saved me $280. Okay, so this is a little bit like the homework problem you had, where they asked the difference between a um, you know fully taxed investment and a tax exempt investment, like say a municipal bond. And again, the way you do that calculation to find the true interest rate or after-tax interest rate um, of investment, let's say it's a, uh, a, a you're getting 10% interest um, before taxes, uh, and you're in a 28% tax bracket. How much interest are you are you earning after taxes? What you would do is you'd get one 
minus 0.72. You get 0.72 from um, using uh, 0.28 minus 1. 0.28 minus 1 is 0.72. So anyway, we multiply, in this case it's quite simple, um, the 10% uh, rate by 0.72 and it gives you 7.2%. So then you can now compare that to your tax um, you know, exempt investment. If the tax exempt investment is only given, say, 6%, then you still would want to stay with your taxable investment and, and you know, uh, go ahead and pay those taxes and still be money ahead. Anyway, so there's all sorts of uh, other deductions on here, and you can get, you know, pretty, pretty creative on, on what you're going to, uh, what you're going to do. Okay, so it's off here on a purchase of an item you gave to church. Yeah, anyway, it's going to do a calculation and, and go through and, and uh, be a little bit more thorough than I am by just sort of jumping around in here. Um, another key item, especially for for most of the folks in, in, you know, sort of a college situation, obviously in distance, it's kind of tough to, you know, tell where different people are, but um, there's quite a few education things. Um, obviously, you know, 1098Ts and things like that. Obviously, if your parents are claiming you as a dependent, if you're still in that situation, it's different. But if you're if you're out on your own, um, those things. Uh, medical. Remember, a lot of times medical it's 7.5 percent of your AGI before those numbers start to change. So, um, you know, again, let's look at our our. Um, jump in here on uh, medical for example okay let's say there's we're getting a refund right now of, of 1600 um, <clears throat> and right here um, it's talking about that 7.5 limit so do you really want to enter your medical expenses or are you just kind of spinning your wheels or are, are you gonna you know let's say oh I I had huge medical expenses of, of $1,500 and, and believe me I'm not saying that's not a painful amount but watch what happens uh, medical professionals fees now nah, we're skipping that and then facility fees lab x-ray fees it's going to go through to make sure you catch them all travel expenses so i mean again these things would add up and maybe you're going to hit that fee i mean hit that limit that 7.5 percent but again it's it's going to have to be a uh, fairly high item and then continue and did you get reimbursed again if, if you had insurance or something else that's going to be deducted off of there and you don't qualify because you didn't hit the threshold so again you know it, it pays to to know a bit about the tax you know rules before you um, worry too much about some of those details but um, certain things, oh, other deductions and credits that aren't subject to that limit, um, moving expenses, um, and then there's also a whole bunch of job-related expenses or job search type things that some of you may encounter. You know, if, if you are relocating to another place uh, to, to take a job, if you're flying down to places to do interviews, if you're buying, you know, a suit or something like that, some sort of, you know, wardrobe that is not for personal use, that's a requirement of, of the business. Let's not say it's a uni if it's a uniform, I mean, if you have to buy them yourself, that's one thing. But if it's a uniform that's furnished, obviously that's not your expense, so you can't write it off. But if you are, you know, have a bunch of job-related expenses that are not reimbursed, those are all going to be deductible. Um, you know, as I may have mentioned before, you know, I came out of a military environment, and we had, you know, folks, they wrote off their haircuts because, you know, they said, I, I wouldn't have my hair this short unless I, you know, was in the military. So, believe me, they're, they're you know, looking for little small things, but in, uh, in the end, all these things add up, you know, magazine subscriptions to professional publications that you wouldn't have unless you were involved in that sort of work, all those sort of things. Um, add up legal fees again that's uh, can't be uh, you know 
divorce related type stuff it has to be things that um, have to do with um, employment or business and you know to tell you what will qualify what won't qualify again you want to back things up but if you had a tremendous amount of say legal expenses uh, see if it see if it qualifies um, you, you can only claim things in one place you know here's a moving expense here's a job related expense you, you'd have to put it in one category or the other so um, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch more time on this, but you know, I, I just think it's worth it to uh, for people to explore it. And again, you know, you've seen this whole process here. I I haven't entered in a credit card number. In fact, you know, that's not my real name. I'm not UAA. Anyway, um, all that stuff um, in terms of of payment and and giving any money to TurboTax or tax cut or H and R Block or that doesn't happen until you actually file. So. In terms of exploring and figuring out your tax situation, um, I think that this is a pretty useful tool and makes you sort of a more informed uh, consumer and, and investor. You know, um, again, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of most salesmen, and, and they will say, "Oh, do this because it's tax deductible. Do this because we'll get you a tax break." You know, buy this solar system because it's all tax deductible. Um, a lot of times those folks don't know the rules and, you know, you, you may end up with something that uh, come tax time, it's, it's a little too late and, and you thought it was deductible or, you, you, you know, you're saving receipts for something, you know, you're, you're saving your prescriptions knowing that your, your total amount over the year might be six, eight hundred bucks, you know, uh, save yourself some time. You don't need to bother with that if you're not going to hit the, the thresholds. So it, it depends on the thresholds. The the medical one I think is kind of a well, it's kind of a rip because it's it's that seven point five percent threshold, which to me seems seems quite high. These other ones either may not have a threshold at all or are, are at a two percent level, which two percent you know if you're making a hundred thousand dollars that's two thousand bucks. It's it's fairly easy to come up with a, a large number of items. Also in the retirement. <clears throat> You know, investment expenses, uh, all those things you, you'll be able to uh, calculate in there. Uh, if you're doing a 401k or some sort of tax deferred program, that will already have been reflected in your W-2. Your W-2 will not, in this case, where we say we're making 100,000, but we're putting, um, you know, 20,000 in a 401k. That 401 or that W-2 that you receive because that's done by the employer in terms of that those withholdings that will you know you, your w2 will reflect that you make 80,000 a year so those numbers are already calculated in there again if you're self-employed things get a bit more complex but um, again the, the the numbers will will all work out in the end um, anyway just a couple things you know the to kind of help you, but in terms of tax planning, uh, you know the the big thing is to is to at least be familiar with with the the tax rules. You're you're not going to master them all, and I'm not going to be able to, you know, not that I I'm not a tax lawyer, so I'm not in a position even to teach you all the rules. But you and 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 you know will hopefully know enough to to make some informed decisions throughout the year to to minimize your tax burden and to do things smartly and and you know figure out what qualifies you know we're going to talk about 529 plans and it's good to know what those are you know 529 are a way to save for college that's going to be a, a tax exempt as long as it's spent on education related experiences or expenses so you know you say you're going to save for your kids college and you're putting it in, in a regular account that's that's paying taxes every year. Now, what you should be doing is, if that's truly your intent, put it in a 529 and and you know enjoy that that tax benefit right now. Anyway, there's a lot of things like that. If you go through here, you'll you'll you know you'll see, oh yeah, I didn't know that, and and you'll you'll become a little bit more familiar with the tax code in a more in a, in a friendlier, easier to understand format than than cracking up cracking open some uh, IRS publication or even the tax guides that again are a little dry. Uh, this by just plugging in numbers and seeing what happens uh, it, 
it's a little bit more interesting. One other thing up here, you can see I didn't even put in any property tax. Obviously, we're going to pay property tax. And, and generally, if you're paying property tax, um, let's see what happens here. We're going to say 3600 bucks. So, what's that, about 300 bucks a month? Boom. So, you know, I got some of that money back. So, this is when it's green like this and the number's going up. It's a refund. If I'd owe money, it'd be red. and be going the opposite direction. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much enough for now. Um, we'll be back on regular schedule next week. You know, obviously with two lectures. So, uh, we'll see you then.